Zelda, and this is my dad, Kit. Hello, how's it going? What are, we here, what are we doing here today, Zelda? We're showing you the game Godspeed. We opened it last day. That's right. We got Godspeed <laughs> by Pandasaurus Games, designed by Adam Hill and Clayton Hargrave. I'm going to give you a quick overview of how to play in just a minute, and then come back for some first for some of my first impressions based off of my first playthrough. Um, just a quick spoiler, I do really like it. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll go into a little bit more at the end of this video, so stick around, and uh, let me show you a quick, uh, quick overview of how to play. Alright, and welcome back. I'm, we're now all set up. Um, I'm not going to go over most of the setup, but let's just talk about... So for the High Council and the Supply Depot are probably the most fiddly parts of setup, but even they're pretty straightforward. Um, the rulebook tells you how to build your supply deck. It's basically you're just going to have uh, three seasons of cards stacked up with the relics in a particular spot. But I don't need to waste your time with that. The book tells it very clearly. Same thing for the High Council. Also pretty simple to set up. It's just sorting out a few cards, shuffling some stacks together. All right, so let's talk about the game itself and what we've got going on. Over here, we've got our player boards. Every player is going to have a, a nation board, which represents one of ten possible countries. Each of, there's five boards that are each double-sided. Um, currently, we've got a three-player setup with Australia, Europe, and Zimbabwe. Each player will also have five um, specialists. These are your workers. I have the Kickstarter, or I have the, I got the upgraded components, so you have these fancy plastic discs, which do feel really nice, but the retail version, all the bits are very thick cardboard, so you're not really gonna, I would not complain if I had the retail version, and we'll probably switch out these prestige markers for the cardboard ones, because they slap. So you're also, each character is going to have four prestige markers, which are going to go onto this prestige track. Um, one of the ways you're going to get points in this game, at the end of the game, you will get points off, based off of where you are in each of these tracks. Eight points if you're the highest, four if you're the second, one if you're the third highest. Another way you can get points is these Lunar Season Objectives. So there's going to be three of those, um, and you have to complete them within the season. Season one takes place within the first three rounds, and this one says, any nation that completes both Exploration and Commerce card this season receives plus three victory points. So if during, if during any round, during these three seasons, I do manage to successfully get out both a Commerce card, which is one of these, and a Exploration card, which is one of these, then I would be able to put one of my little flags on there to designate that I've received those, and at the end of the game, I'd get those points. That's how those work. Then over here, we've got some milestones, which are also worth points. At the end of the game, every milestone you claim is worth three points. Uh, I'll double check that. Maybe it's four points. Four points each. Sorry, my bad. Four points each on milestones. And to achieve a milestone, each of them has what the objective ear is. And so in this case, the first person to get three um, infrastructure cards d uh, deployed, or three, I'm sorry, commerce cards, would get to be able to claim this and just bring it in front of them. Uh, this is three defense cards, three exploration cards, three engineering or infrastructure cards, First person to reach 12 on any prestige track, getting one of each color of card or each type of card, and then the first one to get all four of your production buildings, not counting your relic buildings. So these are production buildings. You've got five of those. Every faction will start with one production building uh, already, already established, and it's gonna be the one that has the star on your player board. That production building, will, it starts off in play, and then below the production board is telling you what, uh, during the income phase of each round, that's what you're gonna produce if you have that building built. Up on top of the board, um, right underneath where the building slots is the resource cost. So very straightforward, there's nothing, nothing in this game is anything I would call innovative or unique, but it's, that's okay, it all ties together in a very seamless, it's pretty seamless, ties in it, it's, it, it's got a very good flow to it. I like the way all the pieces flow together. Anyway, I'm getting sidetracked. I apologize. Um, so everything is set up. Uh, resources, you got four basic resources. Uh, credits, lithonium, what we call kryptonite, or gems, <laughs> relics, and munitions or rockets. Technically munitions. 
Uh, over here, we've also got our Relic Powers, which is one of the cards you'll be able to get through the Supply Depot. It's going to go down here on your Nation Board, but you only get that effect if you've also built your Relic Building, which is one of your building tiles you have over here. And that's the setup, and that's all the components. So the game itself, like I said, we're going to play over 10 rounds. I'm going to we're going to talk about how a round will go, and then I'm going to give you, some, give you my thoughts on the game. Um, so, you got... Four player, you got player rates for everyone as well. They're double sided with a round order and then end game scoring. So, the first uh, phase of every game or of every round is the council phase. So, the high council phase, you're going to flip the high council card and see what you get. For example, this one says espionage. We need to find out what the other, ag the other agencies are up to. We cannot afford to fall behind. Just blend in, keep your eyes open, and don't get caught. Okay, simple, just a little descriptive narrative text. You could totally skip it, but there, it's there. And then it's just telling you which kind, which one of your specialists you need to send to this council meeting. So the count, the high participating participation in the high council is optional. Everyone in turn order. Everyone just based off of the previous turn. So let's say for this turn that Europe is player one. In turn order, everyone decides if they're going to send a representative to the, to the council. And if they do, they're going to take the representative of that type. So like you have five different worker types. You've got an ambassador, ambassador, engineer, captain, trader, and biologist. Ambassadors are, all, and the, these numbers on here represent the influence value of them, which is only pertinent during the next phase. Um, so we'll get back to that in a minute, but all, all factions have the same tiles. S Ambassador is always going to have a seven influence. The rest of them will be a two, three, three, and four, but the distribution is different per faction. So another little bit of slight asymmetry, not enough to make it, not enough to make it any harder to teach because um, everyone still plays exactly the same, but they just have slightly different influences and production costs. So those are your tiles. So in this case, like, like we talked about, this high council, it wants a captain. So let's say Europe decides they are indeed going to send a person. So what I did not talk about, so on these, uh, if you have a successful response, everyone who participated... Well, every, basically, to have a successful response, everyone has to participate. So if we all three put in our captains, no problem. We have a successful response. Every player would get one credit or one lithonium. Now, if any, if a single person, if anyone decides not to, to uh, attend the summit, it's not successful. No one gets the reward. But the penalty, which in this case is minus one prestige on the exploration and commerce tracks, anyone who did not send a representative, representative would take that penalty. So, again, once again, if everyone attends the summit, everyone gets the resource on the success, gets whatever is said on the successful side. If anyone doesn't attend, no one gets the reward but the people that didn't participate take the penalty. That's how the high council phase works. And I just realized I forgot to talk about the last bit of player setup. You have these two cards. You've got a cargo card, which is going to tell you what resources you start with, and you always include the tiebreaker card in your stack. So you're gonna have the tiebreaker plus one cargo card. So for three players, we have the tie, we have the tiebreaker card, two other tiego cargos that got randomly distributed. This tells you what resources you start with. And that's pretty much it. Um, so we missed that. And then you also have this secret, you're also going to have this one little secret objective card, which are basically generally just telling you, you're going to get a free card when you get a particular building out. It's just something to give you a little bit of direction at first, because there are a lot of ways. This is very much a kind of a point style of bit game. So just something to give you a little direction. Um, okay. So we did, so in this case, let's say we did all this and we have completed our high council phase. Where's our missing captain? All right, so say we did that. We okay. So supply, so council phase is done. Everyone would get their choice of a resource of either credit or lithonium. So we would pass those around. Then you move on. So phase one, supply council phase done. Then we move on to the um, supply phase. Whoever current whoever was the first player, is going to put the first player token back in there. And then we're going to reveal one card per player. This 
is one of the most interesting parts of the game. And so this is a little bit of a, you got a little bit of an auction mechanic here. Here is where your influence matters. So again, in turn order, based off whoever had the first player, oh no, sorry, not in turn order. Everyone's going to take all their ambassadors and any credits and lunar rovers that they happen to have and hide them under, and they're going to hide them. And then in their hand, pick what they want to commit. So in this case, so let's just say we did this. So you can only use, and you can put in as, you, as many, you have to put, if you're going to participate in the supply, in the draft, you have to put in at least one of your specialists. Um, you don't have to participate at all. If you don't, you just simply don't get any cards. But in this case, everyone's going to grab, is going to take their things. And then at the same time, they're all, you're going to reveal your hand, normal auction. Let's just get a couple of random things here. So, and then you're going to reveal. And you're going to just kind of put them in here. So in this case, this is way overkill. But, so, what do we have here? Now, these you couldn't use because those are not credits. You can't buy influence with Lithonium. Only with credits and the influence of your person. So, here we've got a four. We don't have... Oh, you have to put a... You also have to put one of these. All right, sorry about that. So here we've got, someone has four influence, three influence, and this is nine influence. So then it would be, based off of that, whoever has the highest would get to draft a card first. So in this case, nine has the highest. Um, you could draft first or dra a card or the first player token. So I'm going to take this. Let's just say I take this, which instantly gives me a Lithonium, and we'll go to the discard. Let's say the next would be Zimbabwe, and let's say they take that. Very simple. I said this. It's, it, the resolution is very simple. And then, does Europe take the first player token? Sure. Let's say Europe takes the first player token, which means they're a first player for the rest of the round. Since the player with the highest bid gets to also take whatever wasn't drafted, so I would also get this card. Now, however, if I had put in this, and we've got three, three, and three. We've got a tie for highest. There's no true highest. Then no one gets that spare card. You have to have the highest by yourself to get that extra remaining card. And that, and then whatever you place there stays. Same with over in the supply within the high council. So whatever, and so whatever you commit stays. And in the supply phase in particular, you can put more than one specialist. So if you really want to make sure you're getting that first draft. You know, you can stack as many as you want, but then that's at people you don't have for the action phase. Okay, so now we move over. Last phase, or the third phase, is the action phase. And in turn order, going round clockwise, you're going to take one action at a time, and you get to take up to two actions if you have the people available. So the action phase is essentially your work replacement phase. You've got... Um, these are your, these, these are your space, spaces to go to for the worker, worker replacement act, uh, section of it, or the action phase. You have the commerce location. So for the commerce location, you need a trader. Once, and, and this is set up on the three player side, so only one person can go here. Once someone goes here, you can't. So, but when you come to the commerce spot, very clear, you get to gain two resources of your choice from the basic resources. And that's it for that part. Um, that's if you have your specialist, but you can also you also have generic spots down here that looks like they can it can be done with anyone. They don't require the specialist, so I could put anyone I wanted to this spot. And then the bottom spots those let you draw cards or complete cards. So right now, right now I don't have any cards in hand. Um, so if you come here, you get to either draw three cards and keep one. So I would draw one, two, three. Discard two, keep one. Let's say I kept this one. So these are infra or, um, development cards. So at the top of the card is the cost again. So we just, to, to, to build this infrastructure or this development cost me two credits, one lithonium, two munitions. And that's their benefit. It would instantly give me two prestige on the commerce track and one on the defense track. But I haven't built it yet. I've only bought it. So it's just going to sit here. Um, and then, although technically, I'm not first player. So let's say they did that. <laughs> okay? Anyway, 
We're just talking about spots. So commerce spots, you come and get some resources or get your commerce cards or build cards. Uh, exploration fight, um, when you come over here to the field test with your biologist, again, that requires your biologist. You can either, you can draw two developments from any two stacks. They have to be from two separate stacks. And that's it. And if you come down here, you same as before, you can either draw three cards, keep one, or build one. So let's say I already had this card in my hand and I had the resources for it. Um, if I had this card in my hand and I came over here, I could then build this card for three, three credits. And in this case, I only have two, but I do have a rover, which is a wild, so I could use that. And then two munitions. And I would take that card. And this says, immediate effect, you may take a diplomacy action without assigning a team member. And it also gives me three points on the prestige track. So Zelda, could you move Europe up three points? Blue on the green track. Again, I would not actually be able to do this in the first round because I wouldn't actually have any cards, but we're just showing you. Right there? Sure. Okay, so that's how you, so that card, you're supposed to just discard them, but again, they're also needed for tracking, for getting your milestones, so I would just keep that even though you've resolved the effect. Um, it also says you may take a diplomacy action without assigning a team member. Your diplomacy actions are down here. You got two different diplomacy actions you can take, one of them which requires an ambassador, one that requires anybody. So for this action, you get to take any um, any uh, development card of your choice and two lunar rovers. But then everyone else gets one basic resource. Or you can come over here and take the leadership action where you get to take any one development card. Um, so then, so all these work the same. You come over here to the defense. Come over here to the defense spot with your uh, captain who we all put over here, so we actually would not be able to use this spot because no one has a captain. But if you did, you get to search the supply depot, which is this uh, pile over here, and take one of one card, one of the discarded cards. Um, and then we have, uh, over here is where you can again draw three cards or build a card. And over here, if you're with the infrastructure, you can use your engineer and do a, uh, to produce one of your production buildings. Again, play in the cost, and you just slot that in, and then you'll be able to produce at the end of the round. Or draw three cards, keep two. The last spot on the board is the scrapyard, which has anyone can go there. It has unlimited, it, it's not locked off. It's your pity, you know, your pity spot. Go there, and grab a basic resource. And that's it. You're gonna do that twice. Um, you can do that twice per twice per round until you into uh, through 10 rounds and you're going to grab keeps it you're going to grab milestones you're going to put points on things you're going to build prestige uh, just all trying to build the best uh all, all trying to have the most prestige on this new planet so that you can claim it as yours for your nation uh so what else did i miss anything in setup let me think or not or overview uh, ba, 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 ba. so i think what do you think, Zelda? Does that cover everything? I think so. <laughs> um, I'm not happy with how that went. That seemed like kind of stuttery and stammery and blah. No? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. You think you could learn off of that? If you were watching that, would you have an idea how to... Yeah. Did you pause it? That's okay. No. We, we'll we can edit it out. Yeah. Um, yeah, just keep it running for a second in case I think of anything I need to add. Um... Yeah, I don't like that I forgot about the cargo cards. Please edit out that card I just did. Okay, don't stop, don't stop. Did you stop? No. Okay. <laughs> See, that just gets... Okay, um... So, a couple of things I did not talk about that I want to talk about. So, within this supply depot, you've got a couple of different... You've got general resources like we've talked about. Um, you've also got... Special, you've got specialists essentially, your special team members. So if you get like this card is a lab tech. So if you draft this lab tech, it's just going to sit in your hand, and at any during the action phase, you can use this as a biologist. So if your biologist is already assigned and you really want to take the biologist action, or if someone's already at the biologist space and you want to take it, it lets you take that action even if someone's already there. So stocking up on a couple of these is always nice. Um, 
You've also got further down in the deck. So you've got a couple special. You've also got some cards that let you do things during the, uh, basically this represents a high council card. Um, you can play this to uh, not have to send the specialist, but still be there. And then you've got relics. So if you want to build your relic building, the only way to do that is you got to draft one of these relic cards. There's going to be one per player. And they are very have a varying cost. Basically, if you draft a relic card, it's just going to sit beside you. And then it's going to tell you, like this one says, as an action, place any three team members to build your relic. So it's expensive. It's going to cost three team members on one action. So in this case, I couldn't do it because I only have two. Um, so that's how you get your relics out. And then even fur then, further down towards the bottom of the stack, you're going to have these relic powers. When you draft one of those, you get to take one of these relic power tiles and slot it onto your board. And if and only if you have your relic building in place, then during the produce phase, which we'll talk about in just a second, you will get to trigger whatever your relic power is, unless some of the relic powers are just uh, uh, points at the end of the game. Um, so then, so yeah, we talked about the action phase. We did for one or two actions. Resolution phase. We did not talk about the resolution phase. That's the final phase of each of each, uh, of each round. Um, you're going to get relic power. You're going to get re relic prestige and, and use power tiles. So relic prestige is like, I've got my relic building out, which for this person says, I get one, I go up one prestige in the engineering or infrastructure per round. So at the end of during that phase, um, blue would go up one on infrastructure. Okay, that, and then also, since I, if I had this here, you may complete development cards using one. Oh, that's actually, that's a stat. This would be an ongoing bonus that would make developments cheaper to deploy for the rest of the game. Because it says you may complete uh, development cards using one less resource. So no production bonus. That's okay. Then use building resource abilities. You're going to go through and look at all your buildings that you've completed and get that benefit. So in this case, with the um, bike bio core out, I would get a tech. Okay, then you're gonna look over here and you got uh, collect resources, uh, use building resource ability, collect resources from production abilities. Actually, that's what we just did. Uh, retrieve agency members, so you're gonna pull all your guys back. Pretty standard. Get your, uh, all this stuff that went into the supply thing just goes away. All right, Refer, return the first player to the supply. And then pass the tiebreaker marker clockwise. So the tiebreaker marker is basically, so in that case with the supply thing, if we, in the, so in the supply phase, if you have a tie, the tiebreaker marker is used to just determine how you break the ties, um, starting whoever's closest to that position and going clockwise. Uh, so that's that, and that would be the, that would finish up the resolution phase. And then you just repeat that nine times and see who won. And there you have it. That is how you play Godspeed by Pandasaurus Games. All right, so that was How to Play Godspeed by Pandasaurus Games. Uh, a couple of quick first impressions based off of my one playthrough with my wife at two players. It's We both really liked it. Um, I think the, the High Council phase in particular will definitely be more interesting with more players. I mean, it's, yeah, it, it's, that's the type of thing. Four or five players is going to make that become way more interesting. We never had a tie, um, which would definitely make it a little more interesting, but it was still, we still really enjoyed it. The high, like I said, the high council phase was the weakest, was the, or not the high council phase, the supply phase, um, where you're doing the bidding. Um, the high council phase is pretty straightforward. Um, but no, we really, we, we, we really enjoyed it. I found, I found everything flowed really well by the end of like the second round. We both had a, we, we're fully in control, you know, fully grasped everything. There's everything fits together nicely, and so it plays pretty intuitively once you get going. It looks like a lot going on, um, but it's not. And I think that I love. I think the artwork is great. Um, it's all very the, the, the theme carries through. The components and they all feel great. The cards are pretty decent quality. All the cardboard, like I said before, is excellent. Um, very thick. Uh, the plastic resources are, are, of course, great, but even if you just got the cardboard resources, they're still really nice. Um, so, yeah, nice thick bits. And then I took the cardboard <laughs> and then we got the plastic. Yep. Um, so, yeah, it all feels really good. I think with, with the premium components, like I said, I do think I'm going to use the cardboard prestige markers because 
the plastic prestige markers, as you, if you try to stack them up, they just tend to slide around and you keep knocking them off. Um, so I think the cardboard markers will be better for that. And, and, the, and the bid bags that were one of the little stretch goal things. You're not really, I use those just for storing the bits in the thing. Um, but other than that, I mean, that, that there's, I, other than, you know, these kind of sliding around, definitely don't have any negatives. I think, I mean, it's the, everything's great. It plays great. Um, if I were to rate this game right now, and again, this is after one play, I would give it somewhere between an 8 and an 8.5. I mean, I really did enjoy it, and I'm you know, definitely looking forward to playing it again. Um, may even try to teach my kids so that they can play it so we can have more players. Um, and that's, yeah, that is Godsby. I, if you have not checked it out, and I mean, I know it might be a little hard right now with everything that's going on. If you didn't back it on Kickstarter, I'm not sure when you'll be able to get it, but I know, I mean, it's Pandasaurus, all their stuff has retail availability. So you're not going to be, you're not going to miss out on anything there. Um, so yeah, there you have it. Godspeed by uh, Pandasaurus Games. I highly recommend uh, you check it out. If you, especially if you like uh, worker placement and drafting. Um, if you don't, then don't check it out. And if you just vehemently hate space theme, then don't bother. Because um, the theme is very much there. I did not actually talk about the theme much. I should probably mention that. So in this in Godspeed, it takes place at the same time as the moon landing with Neil Armstrong. But <laughs> that was just a front. Um, there's been a secret space war going on for decades on a planet... Uh, near Ursa Major, where we have basically discovered that another planet has been discovered that is habitable and has lots of resources. And so all the nations are out there um, trying to get establish as much of a foothold as they can um, to take it. Anyway, so yeah, that's the general premise of it. And that was a horrible explanation, but it's going to have to do for now because my kids are ready to go play outside. <laughs> So, until next time, enjoy and have fun with gaming.